Hey guys, uh, welcome to an anatomy lab, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> now, you may have noticed that there was no anatomy lab last week. The reason for this is twofold. The primary one was that I was shooting with a different camera rig, like I'm using a different camera rig right now, actually. Uh, we, I hope that this turns out better than what I was using beforehand. I guess we'll see. The rig that I used last week, where I shot this whole freaking lab, uh, it, it actually corrupted several of the files, so I had a lab with parts missing. I said, the heck with it, sent that camera back, and we're trying a new one today. We're going to see if this works any better. I hope that it is successful. We shall see. Um, the second reason that I didn't go ahead and redo that lab for last week was I knew you had a test, so um, probably better just to focus on that test and get that done. So today, we're shooting this lab and hoping for the test. We're going to do it all in one big one big try. Let's see what happens. All right, uh, four basic tissue types, and again, this is lab. I feel like you should be pretty darn familiar with this material at this stage, so don't expect me to dwell on this stuff. My main focus is as follows. In lecture, you learn the details of these tissues, sort of what they do and how they do what they do, and then the lab, we're identifying them and understanding some of their, their the, the concepts that deal with the way in which they are identified. All right, so four basic tissue types, epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. Now, your epithelial tissues, they display some characteristics that you are hopefully already aware of. For example, these are the critical boundaries. Okay, the critical boundaries between one area and another. For example, these will have polarity. In other words, you look here, there's a top and a bottom with underlying connective tissue. Supported by connective tissue, there's always going to be underlying connective tissue. Oftentimes in epithelia, there will be specialized contacts. These will be, uh, for instance, in your skin, the, the upper surface of your skin will have desmosomes that will uh, connect those cells together and cause their um, shape to be a very specific way. Uh, they have this spiky appearance, and you, you'll see that because the desmosomes sort of anchor everything together. Uh, that will be avascular. You can see blood vessels down at the base of this. This is connective tissue. There are no blood vessels up in the physical epithelium. Because epithelia are avascular, they're supported both chemically and physically by this underlying connective tissue. There will be a diffusion up of nutrients to keep that tissue functioning. And um, that's more or less good enough for me. Uh, worthy of note is their regenerative capacity. These will regenerate quite quickly for obvious reasons. Uh, these are going to be keeping out potential pathogens. We want them to heal fast so that they can do that job. Now, we classify epithelia based off of two concepts. How many layers thick are they? If it's one layer thick, we call them simple. If it's more than one layer thick, we call them stratified. And uh, then we classify them by their shape. So are the cells flat, then they're squamous. Are the cells kind of squarish, we call them cuboidal. And are the cells kind of tall, then they would be columnar. Now, a quick note of reference here is that cuboidal epithelium does not mean necessarily square. What it really is going to look like is a nice round nucleus with a kind of equidistant cell around it. Uh, sometimes they can have a squarish appearance. Sometimes they can be quite round in appearance. The idea is they're not tall and they're not flat. All right, first, simple squamous epithelium of the kidney. Now, the kidney is where I want you looking for this. And if you uh, check your canvas, you will find that I have uploaded a sheet that has all the details you really need to know about these tissues all pre-done, everything's there. It's an Excel file, you'll see it. Um, I want you to know that simple squamous epithelium is found primarily in the kidneys, and the lungs is a great place to look for this, but the kidneys is what I will use. And in the kidneys, what we're looking at here is called a glomerulus. That's this round structure here, and the lining of it, that is simple squamous epithelium. If you look at it, it's like, let's see if this works. Doesn't work, okay, we tried. Um, there is a lining here. There's a nucleus of the cell and kind of a cell around it. Nucleus, cell around it. Nucleus, cell around it. Nucleus, cell around it. Nucleus, cell around it. They are flat, folks. They are utterly flat. Okay, this is simple squamous epithelium. Again, also found in the lungs, lining the alveoli of the lungs, uh, which are the air sacs. Simple cuboidal epithelium in the kidney, uh, great for secretion, great for absorption, whereas the uh, simple squamous is primarily just m like major filtrative. Like everything gets through simple squamous, whereas these are far more selective because the cells are thicker. And now look at these. They look square per se. I don't think that they do. What they have is these nice round nuclei and a cell kind of equidistant around it. Now, some of these look pretty square 
And if you get into the kidneys, into what are called the collecting ducts of the kidneys, you can get legit square cells, man. They look real square, uh, but not always, all right? Not always. Like all of this down here, this is all going to be simple uh, cuboidal epithelium as well. They don't look nearly as square as these do. Perfect. Uh, next is simple columnar epithelium. Now, simple columnar epithelium is pr uh, found primarily like in your intestinal tracts. The small intestines have really nice, clean, Simple columnar, the large intestine has a little more messy uh, simple columnar epithelium, but all the same, simple columnar. And if you look at these, uh, you have this nice line of nuclei with tall cells. That is classic simple columnar epithelium. Uh, these will have tight junctions between them, which is fascinating. And uh, further, there will be, um, what was I going to say? Oh, they're, they're tall, so their capacity to be very selective on what they allow in is high. Right, so they will only allow certain chemicals into the underlying connective tissue, which would then get into your bloodstream. The reason for this is very simple. Your intestines are not sterile. There's a lot of bacteria that live there, and you don't want to go septic. You don't want to get bacteria into your uh, bloodstream. Yeah. Oh, worthy of note here is the goblet cells. This is large intestines. You can see these goblet cells in there. Uh, those would be producing mucus, which would line that passage and... Um, allow for easier flow of things through. It's a lubricant, basically. Think of it as a lubricant. All right, next is pseudostratified columnar epithelium. You'll also hear this called pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Okay? The reason we call this pseudostrat is because it looks stratified, but it's not. It's one layer thick. There's a basement membrane. Every cell touches it, and then the cells are different heights in terms of their nuclei. The nuclei can be all, all over the place. They're not lined up. This is pseudostratified. And again, this is ciliated. You can see the cilia at the upper surface. The way I would test you on this is I would say, um, identify the tissue in the slide, pseudostratified. Identify the structures at the end of the corner, cilia. Uh, question three, uh, where would you find this in the body? You'd say trachea or tracheal passages, lower respiratory tract, all right? Uh, this is the, uh, the tissue that beats material up and out of your respiratory tract. Stratified squamous epithelium, specialized for um, areas subject to high abrasion. And um, stratified squamous, man, it comes in a whole variety of forms. Generally speaking, what you want to see is round cells at the bottom and then flat cells as the higher you go. These cells are alive, and as they move up, they die, and then they flake away. It's just how this tissue works. Perfect for dealing with um, um, rough environments, if you will. <clears throat> Think about a bacterium. Number one, they can't get in here because it's covered in poison, basically. Number two, these cells at the top are dead, so there's nothing really to eat. It's kind of survival in cardboard boxes. And number three, if I attach one of these cells, it's going to flake away in mere moments, so the home's always disappearing. What a wonderful, wonderful tissue to defend yourself. Now, there are, as I said, a variety of different um, types of stratified squamous. There is keratinized and non-keratinized. Keratinized stratified squamous looks like this with a flaky layer at the top. When you see that flaky layer, you know it's keratinized. Non-keratinized stratified squamous looks like this. It's kind of smooth at the upper surface. And uh, worthy of note here is, like, uh, the inside of your mouth, that lining, the inner, like your inner cheeks, that is non-keratinized stratified squamous. Whereas your outer cheeks, this tougher skin, okay, like on, on, on your arm, uh, that's going to be keratinized stratified squamous. Okay? And really all of it contains keratin, it's just some contains more than others. Okay. Next is stratified cuboidal epithelium. We're going to ignore the existence of stratified columnar. Just know it does exist, uh, but I'm not going to ask you anything about it. But I will ask you about stratified cuboidal. <clears throat> stratified cuboidal epithelium is found primarily in your eccrine sweat glands. It's a glandular epithelium. Uh, so this is what, this is the um, the tissue that makes your sweat on like your arms and legs and all over your body. In fact, these are widely distributed, more so than any other gland for that matter. And if you look at these, the cells are not perfectly square. The nuclei are just nice and round, and the cells are kind of equidistant around them. These are not square cells, but this is stratified cuboidal epithelium. That's what it looks like. Okay, classic classic glandular epithelium, um, yeah, found in the skin. And I'll be showing you this as we move forward, all right? You're, you're going to see this in the microscope. 
take the transitional epithelium. So transitional epithelium, the idea is the cells on the outer surface look nice and round, or right? really distinctly rounded external cells. And what will happen here is, uh, with this tissue, the cells will be round when the bladder is empty. Then as the bladder fills, they begin to flatten out. And the more full the bladder gets, the flatter they become. And then when you empty your bladder, they go back to round again. So it's a protective measure. Okay, it's a, a nice protective measure. Allows this tissue to stretch and relax and stretch and relax and stretch and relax over and over and over and over again without becoming damaged. Okay, no damage. And uh, that would be the first week's lab. Let's do the second week. Okay. <coughs> Four basic types of tissue. Okay, now we're moving on to connective muscular and nervous tissue. Now, let's see. What do I want to say here? Okay, here we go. So, connective tissues are super diverse, man. They're just super diverse. There's all kinds of different connective tissues. Everything from blood to bone to cartilage to tendon. All connected tissue. And the reason they are all considered connective tissue is very simple. They all are derived from the same, called an embryonic germ layer during your development. Okay? So the same little spot in that initial blastula of your tissues, okay, way on back, uh, when you were in utero, uh, the same area derived all connective tissue. So they have a shared lineage, ergo they are all considered connective tissue. And because of that shared lineage, they all display the same basic characteristics, and that is that they have cells, ground substance, and fibers. Cells, ground substance, and fibers. All of them. Uh, for instance, here, look at this. Cells. You see them quite easily. Ground substance here is clear. It is a gel-like interior. And then the fibers are everywhere. You can see fibers all over the place. This is bone, cells, osteocytes, all over the place. Okay, that's these little black spider webs all over the place. These little black spots, little spiders to me. Oops, hang on. Ground substance in bone is uh, calcium and phosphate crystallizations, and then the fibers are collagen. Bone is just packed with collagen fiber. It's all in it, okay? So cells, ground substance, and fibers are the main characteristics of connective tissue, and uh, the, the, let's see, what do I want to say next? Let's talk fibers. So there are three fiber types. Uh, let's do reticular first to get it out of the way because we're not going to worry about it in here. Uh, reticular fibers form a net or a network that we aren't going to be dealing with. Uh, you're not going to see this as we proceed through. We just don't have the slides. Um, collagen and elastic fibers, however, you need to be very familiar with. Collagen fiber, um, it's very strong. It's like a rope. Pull against it, it's tight, it goes no further. Elastic fibers are stretchy. Like There's a really good way to, to visualize this. If you feel your Adam's apple or the end of your nose and you feel how hard that is, that's collagen fiber. You can kind of come in here to your arm. If you bend your arm just a little bit and take your fingers, you can dig in and get a hold of the tendon that connects your biceps and you can feel of it. It's so tough, man. It feels like a steel cable in there. But then elastic fiber, it's flexible like your ears. Your ears have a lot of elastic fiber in them. And it's, it gets this really flexible texture by comparison. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So the first one that we need to talk about is loose areolar connective tissue. <clears throat> loose areolar connective tissue is just all over the place in the body. It forms the major exchange boundaries between tissues. So between like your capillary beds and your tissues, you find areolar connective tissue, and this tissue assists with moving things from one place to another. Now, areolar connective tissue is very easy to identify. It's got a very classic look to it. It's kind of open and airy, areolar. Uh, the thick fibers in the background, these kind of pink ones there, those are collagen fibers. And the thin ones in the foreground are the elastic fibers. You can see them quite clearly. And again, this uh, clear background, this is the, uh, the matrix in which you find the, the uh, other materials. And it is quite gel-like, this ground substance, if you will. Perfect. Uh, this is adipose tissue or fat. Okay, everybody loves to hate it. Uh, these are cells full of triglyceride, and boy, they are just everywhere in the body, okay? You've got fat right underneath your skin surface. You have fat that surrounds the kidneys. You've got fat behind your eyes. You've got fat all over the place, okay? It's very important as a cushion, as an insulator, as an energy storage, uh, and it's just everywhere, man. It's just everywhere. Like the lobule of your ear, this little dangly bit down here, if you've got one of those disconnected, that's fat. It's got a lot of fat in it. 
dense regular connective tissue, these are tendons. Okay, dense regular, this is collagen fiber, and you get this wavy appearance. When you see that wavy appearance, you know you're dealing with dense regular connective tissue. The idea is, if you could grab this on both sides and pull, it would get straight. The fibers would straighten out, and it would get very tight and go no further. This is your tendons, all right? Your tendons do the same thing. These are what tendons are made of. Um, you'll oftentimes hear this referred to as white fibrous connective tissue, by the way, because it's devoid of blood vessels, so it has a very light coloration. It's like an iridescent, shiny white color. Uh, but in microscopy, it'll be stained probably pink like this. Collagen fiber, almost exclusively collagen fiber. From my perspective, when I see this, I feel like it looks like bacon, like take a piece of bacon and put it on a frying pan, or alternatively, like a piece of beef jerky. All right? it, has the, it has that appearance. Come on. And then there's dense irregular connective tissue. Now, dense irregular connective tissue is still quite strong. It's still almost entirely collagen. And um, this is going to be found, like, for instance, underneath your skin. So imagine the tendon of my bicep, that's going to be a piece of dense regular connective tissue. It's very strong, pull in one direction. Uh, whereas my skin itself is held on by dense irregular connective tissue. So I can pull up, I can pull side to side and up and down, and it's not going to tear loose because it's not quite as strong as this, but it's strong in every direction, whereas this is only strong if you pull against it in one very specific way. Dermis of the skin. <clears throat> Reticular, and that's not to worry so much about, uh, but we more or less discussed this in, in lecture. This is primarily seen in lymphatic tissues, um, spleen, that kind of thing. Just don't, don't worry about this one, as you'll see. Then let's run through the cartilages. Okay, so there are three forms of cartilage. They are all avascular. These are hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage, and they take on very unique appearances. Worthy of mention, you need to be able to identify chondrocytes and their lacunae. The chondrocytes are the cartilage cells. The lacunae are the openings in which they are found. For instance, chondrocytes, lacunae. Chondrocytes, lacunae. The chondrocyte is the cell, the lacunae is its opening in which it lives. This is hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage takes on a very smooth, glassy appearance. All right, you can see that smooth, glassy appearance. This is because it's basically uh, quite similar to um, these, these dense connective tissues like this. Very, very similar. You just can't quite make out all the fibers in the background. But this is mostly collagen. Uh, and a lot of water. Like, there's a whole bunch of water in hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage, for that matter. <clears throat> hyaline cartilage is the most prevalent cartilage in your body. Your nose, your ribs, like, the, all your articulating cartilage, for the most part, it's all hyaline. It's derived from your uh, initial fetal skeleton. And then there's elastic cartilage. So, uh, elastic cartilage looks just like hyaline cartilage, from my perspective, except... Elastic cartilage is going to have this kind of hairy background. It looks like spider webs a little bit in the background with these uh, chondrocytes in their lacunae. That's classic elastic cartilage. And you'll find elastic cartilage, for instance, in your ear. Okay, good old-fashioned elastic cartilage. Fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage makes up these um, um, your, your intervertebral discs. And the way you identify fibrocartilage, let's be honest, number one, it's always blue. I've never seen non-blue fibrocartilage. But two, it's got like a jelly interior, and then the outer surface is like dense regular connective tissue. This looks just like this. Okay, when you get under magnification, it looks just the same because it pretty much is the same. You get these rings of uh, collagen surrounding a gel-like interior. This is classic fiber cartilage. The idea is the gel-like interior provides a rebound, and then the structural ring of fibers provides uh, internal strength. Bone. So in bone, I want you to be able to identify the osteocytes inside of their openings called lacunae. Okay? Osteocytes and lacunae, bone is bone. Uh, be able to identify the osteocytes, and I will be pretty happy with that. <clears throat> Again, bone is a connective tissue. It's got cells, osteocytes. It's got fibers, mostly collagen, uh, cells, fibers, and um, uh, oh, and, and its background. So it, it's got these calcium phosphate crystallizations. 
worthy of mention here is that bone is incredibly vascular, that's a fact. So all these openings are called central canals and perforating canals, and uh, they will contain huge amounts of uh, uh, arter arterial networks, arteries and veins. And then we have blood. So in the realm of blood, there are two types of cells that I want you to be familiar with. The purple ones are called white blood cells or leukocytes, and the red pink ones there are red blood cells or erythrocytes. Erythrocytes and leukocytes, uh, white blood cells function in protection, red blood cells carry oxygen. Now this is still a connective tissue, you got cells, you got ground substance, which in this case is plasma, and then there are of course fibers which are dissolved in this matrix that will only come out of dissolution. They will only materialize, if you will, where you can see them uh, during blood clotting. And that takes us on to muscle. So what do I want to say here? So three types of muscle, all, all types of muscle are going to take chemical energy and turn that into mechanical energy. Skeletal muscle is what we call striated and voluntary. Striated and voluntary. Striated means it's got this stripe of appearance. And voluntary means I think flex biceps and my bicep flexes. Uh, also, these cells will be multinucleated. So here is one big long cell and you can see nuclei just all over the place. Okay, they are multinucleated. Skeletal muscle involved in voluntary motion. Uh, you choose to use this. Cardiac muscle by comparison is a little different. Cardiac muscle, the cells are uninucleated. Uh, it is still striated in appearance but it is uh, involuntary. You don't consciously control it. Your heart beats um, autonomically. You have a center of your brain that causes the heart to beat autonomically. Uh, important here are the intercalated discs. You can see these quite clearly. Those intercalated discs are going to be areas where you find a bunch of gap junctions uh, that allow for free flow of cytoplasm between these cells. So if one gets stimulated, the rest of them become stimulated. This makes your heart beat un in unison, basically. So it's not sort of a long story, but... Uh, very important that these gap junctions exist. And then, of course, there's smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is kind of hard to put your finger on. Okay, smooth muscle is like what's in your stomach, uh, your intestinal tract has a lot of, your bladder's got smooth muscle. And uh, it, it doesn't have a real defining characteristic. It is non striated. Uh, it has one cell per nucleus, or one nucleus per cell. Dyslexia is hard. Um, it's really, you know, you got to get a feel for it. To me, when I look at good smooth muscle, I feel like it looks like a, a river flowing. It's like fish in it, a river flowing. Okay? Uh, if we could just have some time to sit in the lab and look at some microscope slides, I feel like you'd get a feel for this. Like you, you just got to understand, it looks, for lack of better terminology, like a river flowing. And uh, I'll show that to you today. You'll, you'll be seeing it. Involuntary. And then last but not least, there is, of course, nervous tissue. So nervous tissue is going to have uh, neurons. As you can see here, these are neurons. And then all these tiny dots in the background, those are neuroglial cells, which are the helper cells. The neurons convey messages. The neuroglial cells protect and help the neurons. Um, and from my perspective, they look like little types on the screen. Those are, what, those are neurons they look like. So now, what I'm going to do is, we're going to go through and look at each individual slide, and we're going to talk about how to use a microscope effectively. What you see here is a kidney, and what you're looking at is a glomerulus. Now, I can actually go to a lower power here. Uh, this is a on a four power lens, and what you see are these little dark spots around in here. Dark spot, dark spot, dark spot, dark spot. These are all the glomeruli of the kidney, which is where we're going to look at the Bowman's capsule, which is where we're going to find simple squamous epithelium. I can zoom this in a little bit more. And there is a nice glomerulus right there. Here's another one, here's another one, there's one, there's one, they're all over the place. And if I zoom it in just a little more, get a little focus here. There we go. Uh, what we see there is a nice glomerulus. So the glomerulus is obviously the structure in the middle here. And it's inside of an opening called Bowman's capsule. And the um, squamous epithelium lines this. Uh, what we have here is the kidney. And we're going to be looking at 
the simple cuboidal epithelium. Now you can still see glomeruli all over the place. Right? There are glomeruli, all these little black spots, these are all glomeruli. But everything around the glomerulus, those are kidney tubules, parts of the nephron's uh, filtrative apparatus. And what we're going to look at are those tubules. Specifically, we're going to look at a collecting duct. You want to go and look up what that is. So here's a layer in. Uh, you can see there, there are like little round structures, like smaller holes basically, all over the place. There's a big hole right where that pointer is. Those big holes, that's part of a collecting duct. And I can go in a little further. And there are the cuboidal epithelium, simple cuboidal. One layer thick, one layer thick, and the cells are indeed quite square. Uh, what you see here is the intestines, and what we're going to look at is simple columnar epithelium. Now, we've got a little white balance issue here, but what you see on this side, these are, this is a villus, and there are smaller villi here. Lining these villi, okay, these are going to be increasing surface area. Think that this is the intestine, we've had these crazy undulations, and then inner undulations. Lining these villi is where you're going to find these simple columnar epithelium. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to zoom in a little further. Okay, so you can see in this a bunch of little pieces of villi. Remember, this is a 2D structure. So these are all little pieces of villi. And if I zoom in on one of them, what you can see is this line of nuclei here. All of this, all of that, here especially, this little line of nuclei. This is classic... Um, simple columnar epithelium, and if you look, this is probably large intestine, you can see there's goblet cells, there's three in a row, there's two, one and two, there's one at the end. These are all goblet cells, and uh, these are what produce mucus that lines the intestinal tract. This is stratified cuboidal epithelium. What you see all up in here and all over there and all down in there. These are all parts of eccrine sweat glands in the skin. So if I zoom this in just a little bit more, what you have here is a nice eccrine gland, or at least part of one. So this would be one big long tube, and it would be all wound up, and when it's cut, it gives you this appearance of a bunch of circles. So if you look at these individually, uh, you'll see round nuclei and more than one layer of thickness that makes these stratified cuboidal epithelium. And if you look kind of above it and below it, if you look up in here and down in here, what these are are little pieces of collagen fiber because this is in the dermis of the skin. This is dense, irregular connective tissue around it. In fact, if I just kind of pan off to the side a little, you can see this. This is all dense, irregular. If I pan to the top, let's see here. There is stratified squamous epithelium. So this is the skin, stratified squamous in the skin. So what we have is if we can find a nice spot. Yeah, there we go. So this is stratified squamous in the skin. And you can see the flaky layer at the top, which makes this keratinized stratified squamous. Quite interestingly, there, you can see that there's like a, a dark line, kind of a brown line. You guys see this? It kind of follows the lowest layer, brown line all the way across. This is uh, probably from a person with a darker complexion, so they're producing melanin. So this is that one little layer there, kind of a at the bottom and just above it, is what gives rise to uh, human skin coloration, which is kind of fascinating. And then, if I wanted to, I can pan down. Okay, there's another piece of, actually that might be a piece of an artery. There's some more glandular tissue, glandular tissue. If I pan down and down and down, what I will eventually run into down here, this is all dermis of the skin, 
Dermis, 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 dermis. Still the dermis. We're panning down. What eventually happens, it's kind of hard to see, but I assure you, there's some little lines there. It's hard to see, but this is adipose tissue down in the bottom. What we have here is a bladder slide. Uh, this should look pretty familiar to you. You can see this border where I'm pointing. All right, this, actually if I pan around a little bit, I can show you. What we have around here, this is like um, smooth muscle all down in here. And then the epithelial lining is this bit here. Now I can zoom in a little. And let's focus. These are the little round cells. You can kind of make those out of transitional epithelium. You can imagine these becoming quite flat when necessary, when the bladder fills, and then coming back to this round shape when the bladder is empty. What we have here is um, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And I can zoom this out a bit in a second. But you can see the cilia at the top. I can zoom it out. And what you see here is the epithelial lining. And then below that is the hyaline cartilage. So all of this, this is all hyaline cartilage through here uh, that surrounds and sort of protects the tracheal passages. So that's all hyaline cartilage all through there. There's some adipose over there. And it's all hyaline cartilage. So this is a ring. You can see the trachea. Yeah, man. What we have here is areolar connective tissue. You can kind of see what it looks like. This is just a bunch of fibers, basically, that's been torn off of a, probably a basement membrane someplace. And what we can do is we can zoom it in a little, like so. And you can see all of this fibrous network that's there. And we can go in a little further. And what I want you to notice is the kind of thin, darker fibers, like this one here in the foreground. That is an elastic fiber. All the clear space would be the, the ground substance piece. And the background, you can see these pink fibers, like this one here, okay, this big, thick pink fiber. That's collagen. The purple ones that are in the foreground that are thin that's elastic um, fibers, elastic fibers. And then the pink ones that are kind of thicker in the background, that is collagen fiber. So this is a good aerial or connective tissue. All right, guys, this is dense regular connective tissue. Uh, what I want you to notice is the wavy lines in this. If I can zoom it out a little bit, you can kind of see that cut edge and those wavy lines, that is classic, dense, regular connective tissue. This is hyaline cartilage. I can zoom this in a little further. All right, those are chondrocytes in lacunae. You can see this very smooth appearance. All right, this is classic, classic hyaline cartilage. Uh, in this particular case, coming from the trachea, all right? Nice, clean, hyaline cartilage, and there's my phone ringing because I'm popular. All right, if that's hyaline cartilage, compare it to, let's see if we can find elastic cartilage there. Some elastic cartilage, right in there, looks like a winner. All right, that is elastic cartilage. They look similar, all right, they certainly look similar. But you can see this webby background here, like that in, right in there, right in there. That is uh, very, very indicative of this uh, elastic cartilage. Very similar. You can still see a bunch of chondrocytes and lacunae. All right, for instance, I could say on your test, I could say, Identify this cell, and you'd say that's a chondrocyte. And I'd say, what's the opening it's found in called? And you'd say, it's a lacunae. And I'd say, where in the body would you find this? 
Now, since it's elastic cartilage, you'd say the ear. Okay? That's how this works. Now, that's that. Then this is going to be fibrocartilage. Let's see if we can find it here. It'll probably help if I drop my mag a little. There we go. Now, the slides for fibrocartilage don't preserve well, uh, which is why we have this appearance here. But if I zoom in on it, you would notice that it is kind of similar in structure to the previous ones we've looked at. We've got this nucleus pulposus, this gooey center portion. It looks a lot like what we just looked at. The key difference in the part that I want you to be familiar with is over here. You see this? Look at the rings of fibers. Can you tell they're in rings? Right? Little pieces. That these are bands of collagen. Thick bands of collagen that surround this tissue. And uh, by providing this structural support, it makes um, the gooey portion in the middle kind of act like a ball, uh, like a rubber ball, and then this fibrous outer network holds the whole thing together. Pretty neat cartilage. What we have here is a bone slide. Now, bone is very obvious. Start to zoom this in, you get these very distinctive tree rings. What you see, each individual, <laughs> very popular, each individual circle there, folks, is what's referred to as an osteon. Okay. So each little circle, like here's a whole circle, let me get some pointer. Like all that, That's, there's an osteon, here's an osteon, here's an osteon, here's an osteon, there's one over there. All the circles, those are osteons. If I zoom this way on in, you get these just beautiful images of bony tissue. Just gorgeous osteon. So pretty right here. Now, look at this. What we have here is osteocytes. All these are called osteocytes. That's what the black things are. Osteocytes are bone cells. They live inside openings called lacunae. And then in the middle of this, right there, that is a central canal. Now, the central canals will have arteries and veins and nervous tissue going through. And actually, if you look, it's kind of hard to make out in some cases, but it looks good here. You see all the little webby, cracky type stuff kind of in between, all these little lines in between? Those are actually small openings that allow for the diffusion of nutrients and waste products. And there's little bits of nervous tissue that travel through there as well so that all the bone cells can then communicate with the central canal which then communicates with the brain, and that is bone tissue. All right, what we have here is blood, folks, and I do this to you on purpose. Like, it probably looks like a whole bunch of nothing on this particular view that you're getting right now, um, and I want you to see this because I want you to see just how small your red blood cells actually are. We're actually at four time magnification right now, so we're going to go up to this 10 times. All right, there's 10 times. You can kind of begin to make out the cells here. At least you should be able to. They're very, very small in the background. And then I'm going to go up to 40 times. That's 400 power, as high as these scopes go. So now you can see individual red blood cells. Okay, that's a little pink donut. And then also a white blood cell, a white blood cell, and a white blood cell. So white blood cells are far more rare by comparison. The red blood cells make up the vast majority of your hematocrit. And uh, these are oxygen carriers, obviously, and the white blood cells are defensive ones. And if you notice, these white blood cells, they all look a little bit different from one another. That's because there's a lot of different types of white blood cells that do different jobs. And that's pretty cool. It's a good view. What we have here is skeletal muscle. Right, this is as zoomed in as zoomed in can be. I hope you can make out the striations there. I can actually drop it down a level. You can kind of see what we're dealing with. So zooming in, there are those nice striations. You should be able, be able to see them pop a little bit. Now I want you to compare that one to cardiac muscle. All right, let's zoom it in a little and see if we can find it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'll, that'll work you look, you can kind of see the striations a little bit. I'm playing with the fine focus as we go. But what I really want to point out to you are the intercalated discs. 
Now, it'll probably be better on an image, but there's one, there's one. Can you see there and there? All these little lines through here. These are intercalated disks. There's one there. Okay, so those are intercalated disks. Those are going to be with gap junctions in between um, the uninucleated cells. Now, compare that one. Again, two, two types of muscle to the third type of muscle. And this is going to be uh, smooth muscle. Now, what I actually have here is a bladder. Okay, there's the, the inside of the bladder. That's all bladder right there. And all of this on the outside, this is all smooth muscle. And it doesn't look like a whole lot of anything. I can zoom that in. And remember, when we think smooth muscle, you want to think it looks like a river flowing. That's the idea, at least. Oh, by the way, look at that. A little bit of uh, adipose down there. Zoom in a little more. Get the focus right. Let's see if we can find any rivers flowing. That looks kind of flowy. See what I'm getting at? See? Like it's coming through and then up. Let me get in there. So it's coming down and it kind of makes the curve there. This is classic smooth muscle. All right? Doesn't look anything like the other ones. Kind of a flow through there. All right, can you kind of get a... Oh, here we go. Yeah, that looks good. So it's going to come down through here. That's classic smooth muscle. Um, it's not one that's easily identified if you don't really know what you're dealing with. But when you see it on the outside like this, of like a bladder, for instance, this is classic, classic smooth muscle. All right, what I can do now is I can go up a power, let the camera set a little bit, and I can use a little bit of focus here to give you a nice sharp image of some neurons. And then I can, that's 10 power, I can go up to 40 power, give the camera a few moments to figure out what's happening, and let's see if we can focus. We can, look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful neuron. So well, that is the end of our second anatomy lab, and uh, maybe we'll try and do some more lectures from our glorious lecture hall here, as it is a really nice place to work, and you might get a little more out of it than just my dark screen. So, um, work hard, prepare for your exams, and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Have a good night.